This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in Chicago. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, in Libya, at least 6,000 are feared dead. Thousands more remain missing after a catastrophic flood in the eastern city of Derna. Torrential rains from Storm Daniel caused two dams to burst, wiping out whole sections of the city. Water reached 10 feet high in parts of the city. The United Nations has called the flood a, quote, calamity of epic proportions. Rescue operations have had difficulty reaching Derna because there's only one unobstructed road into the city. In front of Derna's hospital, people are searching for their loved ones amidst piles of dead bodies lined up on the ground. This is the hospital's manager, Mohamed Akabisi. The number of dead in this particular section is 1,700 deaths so far. We counted them as they were lying in the hallways. Whoever is identified is then buried. There are some who have not been identified. So we started photographing them and assigning numbers to them, then burying them as well. On the other side, they buried 500 people. Things are very bad. The hospital is dilapidated. Mohamed Kamati, who lives in Derna, said many people were sleeping when the dams failed. Then we heard that the dam had burst and the water had flooded the area. People were asleep and no one was ready. But this is what happens. What can we do? For me, my house is next to the valley, opposite the Al Shahaba Mosque. The whole family lives next to each other. We are all neighbors. We lost 30 people so far, 30 members of the same family. We haven't found anyone. Much of Libya's infrastructure has crumbled since 2011, when the Obama administration and NATO backed an uprising against the longtime leader Muammar Gaddafi, setting off years of war and political upheaval. Derna's mayor said the city's dams have not been maintained in over 20 years. The flood was caused by a rare hurricane-like cyclone in the Mediterranean, known as a Medicaine. It's the same storm that brought unprecedented flooding to Greece, Turkey and Bulgaria last week. The floods come just a week before a major summit on the climate crisis at the United Nations here in New York. Greenpeace International said, quote, governments must act now to end fossil fuels that are plunging us deeper into climate disaster Bad. every day. Pakistan, Nadim Karwar EPA, Libya, as part of key of IMF Tripoli, demands, where we're the government was asked to remove subsidies in the power Thanks sector, so much hiking for energy and fuel prices, that and allowing a market-based currency exchange rate without artificially shoring up the uh, local currency. Since the start of the new fiscal year in July, the Pakistani rupee has devalued by 10.5 percent against the United States dollar, going from 275 rupees at the start of July to 304 on Wednesday, August 30th. Following the Thank IMF so agreement, Pakistan's um, power all, regulator um, also increased the national average overall, tariff by uh, around 5 rupees per unit and another. This very specific event, it does not mean that the west uh, part of Libya is usually not affected by uh, heavy rainfalls or even um, other smaller um, storms. Uh, in fact, just last week, the city of Zlitan, which uh, is located in the western part of Libya, drowned completely. It was flooded completely just because uh, um, of six hours of rain. And uh, the whole flooding thing is not news to us. We've been struggling with this for years because, as you mentioned, Libya is struggling with poor infrastructure. And it's been like that for years beyond, actually, the, the 2011 revolution, uh, even at time, uh, even during the times of Gaddafi. Most of the well-constructed uh, buildings, uh, we have them since the time of the Italian colonization. It was constructed by the Italian government over 100 years ago. Those remain until today. However, most of the, um, uh, the structures that were built uh, during the 60s, it's, it's, it's usually um, easily affected by rain or even simple weather changes. As for what happened in, in Derna, it was actually expected. I've expected this to happen for the longest. You know, as a climate activist, I'm uh, I'm always pursuing uh, government officials. I'm always doing my best to communicate whatever information that I have. 
um, this is not the first time that Derna goes through this. It went through it uh, twice before in the past decade. It went through it in the 40s and again in the 80s. And just two years ago, uh, Mr. Um, Abdelaziz Ashour, who is a civil engineer, published a paper with the University of Sabha uh, where he warned that both of the dams are very fragile and he expected that they will be falling apart very soon. He also, um, he also mentioned that we need to have a lot of tree planting in the area in order to combat the desertification because all of the sand in the area or like the dry area will only make the flooding uh, like much worse. So it's something that we have expected. Um, in fact, ever since uh, this catastrophe happened, uh, they talked about it a lot in the news from many different aspects, but not climate aspects. They did not mention anything about climate change and in what ways the, uh, the government is at fault at what happened. Because as we mentioned before, this is, uh, it was, Derna is like the fourth stop of the Daniel storm, okay? However, it's the one that is most affected by it. So just to give you a bit of a background on the climate crisis here in Libya, uh, Libya did sign the climate change framework back in 2015 with the UN, and they did ratify the Paris Agreement back in 2021. However, uh, although the government been active at COPs, they did not submit any of the necessary national uh, determined uh, contribution or the national adaptation plans. So these documents supposed to include their risk reduction strategies. So in case something such as this happened, what will, what will they be doing? Um, so the thing is, uh, most of the other countries already declared emergencies and they did evacuations in advance. Libya did not. As they've seen the storm coming our way, and we had, uh, we knew that the storm was coming our way, uh, on its way to the Libyan coast, the government did not announce um, uh, emergency, they did not have any evacuation, not to mention, it wasn't until yesterday when the president came out and he mentioned, and, and he said that, please stop sending medicine and food, we don't actually need this type of aid, what we need is uh, rescue teams, uh, search teams, as well as aid Aid flights. So we're talking about a country that does not even have an aid flight. Uh, so when the, all the roads collapsed, they were not able to actually reach the people. So all of the aid that is being sent by the other countries is not even making it to the to the people. So every minute passed without an aid flight or helicopters meant tens and thousands of other people dying. So. It took them two days to ask for that. And then they claimed on TV that, oh, yeah, we have a strategy and we're working on it right now. But obviously, they did not have a strategy. They do not have a plan. So this just well, shows uh, you that, yeah. Nisa, Beck, I wanted to ask you, what has been the role of the, the Ministry of Environmental Affairs in, in uh, and also Given the fact that uh, for the for the past ten years, ever since the uh, the killing of Gaddafi, Libya has been has had to deal with competing uh, or conflicting governments, so two governments within the same country. Yes, that did have an effect, logistical effect. Um, for example, even the aid that um, Egypt is offering, they're not actually communicating with the government that is acknowledged by the international community. They are in touch with General Haftar in the East, which is the government that is not recognized by the international community, which means that whatever agreement is taking place as we speak right now, the actual president of the country have no idea what is going on. So in that sense, yes, it's quite an issue logistically. but. Um, like like I said before, it's it's mainly a, a climate and environmental issue because, like I said, a huge part of uh, climate or our strategy to combat climate or natural disasters is about the risk reduction strategies that's supposed to be submitted during COPs, but they're not submitting anything. As for the role of the Environmental uh, Affairs Ministry, 
they're supposed to be playing the biggest role in this, but they're not playing any role at all. But to be uh, completely honest, I have a source that told me that the Minister of Environmental Affairs has been submitting a lot of projects and a lot of proposals to uh, President Abdel Hamid Dbeiba. However, he is the one who is rejecting all of those proposals. He just keeps postponing them, and therefore uh, the, the Ministry of Environmental Affairs is not receiving any funding. And according to the employees of the uh, of the ministry, they haven't received their paychecks for over two years. So they are working without getting paid, and it's been like that for over two years. And and what about the the reality that as uh, as Libya confronts uh, the increasing dangers of the climate? Crisis. It still depends largely as a nation for its uh, uh, its foreign income on uh, the, uh, on oil and gas. Yes, and we have uh, we have spoken about that. You know, we've spoken a lot about that, and they're still signing deals with uh, countries such as Italy for the next twenty years and the next thirty years. So they don't seem to take the whole climate issue seriously. And in fact, if you've spoken to any of the decision makers uh, regarding this, they're like, "Yeah, yeah, we understand, but we don't have to worry about that now." That's usually their reply. And I'm hoping that this tragedy could be the turning point for all of this and for them to actually take the climate crisis more seriously. Uh, Nisa, rich countries agreed to establish a loss and damage fund at the close of last year's UN Climate yeah. Summit in Egypt, um, dealing specifically with the global south, um, the worst effects of the climate catastrophe. The fund was a major breakthrough for global south countries, which have been demanding a similar mechanism for the last 30 years, um, but faced opposition from the United States and other large polluting nations. What are your demands of wealthier nations? To be completely honest, yes, the main issue or the root of the issue goes back to the polluting countries, uh, such as the United States. But in this very specific situation, I cannot really um, say that it is their responsibility to fix what happened. Because like I mentioned earlier, it's obviously the, our government's fault. And the problem with this fund that it's not going to bring the lives that we lost back. It is something that comes later on, you know, when it's time to actually reconstruct Derna. Um, a lot of these countries will be putting, you know, some funds in order to help us reconstruct it. But at what cost? I mean, at that point, we've already lost so many people, and we don't know how many other people we're going to lose in the upcoming few years if we don't actually deal with the problem more seriously. So right now, I cannot think of like, oh, it's uh, it's because of the U.S. It's because of China. You know, I don't have that kind of mindset right now. It's because of my own government. In the future, however, I really need all states, whether they're from the global south or the global north, to take this fund seriously. And most importantly, take COP seriously. Take their NDCs and NAPs submissions more seriously. They've seen what happens when you don't take it seriously. You need a risk reduction strategy. You need to, you know, uh, put forward a plan uh, on, like, what are we going to do in case this happens? You know, Libya has a very low level of precipitation. We don't even have a lot of rainfall. And they're like, flooding? What are the chances of us, you know, going through a flooding? Where? There you go. So well, that's what I'm expecting. Yeah. Well, Nisa, I want to thank you so much for being with us. We'll continue what's ha to follow what's happening in Libya. Nisa Beck mm -hmm. is a youth climate activist joining us from Tripoli, Libya.